Um, one of the things I'd start off by saying is that um, our brand is very, very important to us, and I, I think you'll agree that we, we do stand out in the marketplace and very, be very colourful. <coughs> the only reason I say that is because um, this, this uh, topic was, uh, I was asked to do this by, by BRE, and you can clearly tell that this was an academic that actually put this title together, because it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, does it? Uh, the role of the uh, supplier in better access to flood resilience. Um, and having been a proponent in this marketplace, I actually still found that a bit of a struggle uh, to put some slides together uh, on that. So I actually started off by, by raising some questions. And one of the um, topics that came up last week when we had a meeting with some of you guys that are in this room was actually what is resilience? Uh, we've always talked about resistance and resilience in our, in our terminology for the past 10 years that I've been in, in this industry. So to now find that everything is lumped together as resilience, I think we need to be very clear about the message and what we're trying to achieve with people. So I've summed it up here in, in the terms that we've always been using, uh, as far as I'm aware, as proponents of, uh, of PLP, property level protection is resistance is all about keeping the water out. And surely that's the main aim of the game, is to keep the water out of the property. And we, but we can only do that to a certain degree. As a lot of you will know, uh, there's restrictions on how high we can withstand that water with it within a property. So typically 600 millimetres on a, on a standard Barrett house, uh, uh, cav cavity wall house, but you can go to 900 mil millimetres as well. But after that, we do have to let it in, which is why we then want to look at resilience measures. But PLP is more than just looking at keeping the water out of the property. I always say to the surveyors that work for us is that when you get to site, that's OK looking at that property and understanding how it all works. But actually just try turning around and looking at what you've got around you. Look at the topology. Look at what defences you've got that you can actually make some use of. And depending on the flood types, there may be a perimeter solution or maybe including suds is a much better solution than, than putting barriers under the house. And it's all about keeping that water away. So if you can keep it away from the property, you're doing a much better job. <coughs> so we're not adverse, as it says on here, to actually soft and hard landscape. And that is a practical solution, particularly if we're talking about river iron and, and surface water type flooding events. But resilience is, is as, as important, as you say, once we've let the water into the building. Um, we talked uh, in the introduction there about some of the technology we have in our company. Uh, we have a flood resilient door with a, a patented device on it which actually lets the water in. Once we've hit that predetermined uh, height, we want to not knock the house down, so we actually let the water in. When you think of that from a marketing point of view, that's a really crap story. We've got a, f we've got a flood resilient door for you, but it's going to flood your house at a certain amount of time. So I think when you've got that, you've then got to have a resilient technolo te technology and strategy within your company. And resilience is all about how do you recover that property as quickly and economically as possible. Um, within our company, we offer a guarantee that it says that if you follow our advice on both resistance and resilience, we guarantee you will be back inside your house inside of four weeks. We then think that's an insurable solution and that's where where our, uh, our, our game is, is to get to uh, an insurable product. If the solution isn't insurable, uh, we don't believe it's actually a solution. So the next role is to actually say, who are the suppliers? Uh, we're one of them, uh, and there's another one in the in, in yeah. another one in the room here. I just spotted come in late, <laughs> and she's not paying attention now. <laughs> um, so yeah, so property level uh, companies that, that are in this. Uh, in this area are largely providing uh, resistance measures into this industry and we are one component of what those suppliers are. Builders should be another uh, form of, uh, of supplier uh, but actually there's a lot of them don't have any knowledge at all about water and it comes back to a similar issue we have when we talk about surveying uh, properties as well. There's, uh, there's a lot of good property surveyors out there that have got uh, maybe a RICS uh, qualification and uh, they're really good building surveyors but they're actually very little knowledge about hydrology and actually trying to marry those two skills together is quite an art that, uh, that we still haven't managed yet so you can't really expect the poor old builder to know how to put that house together to to stop water getting into it that's not their their general aim 
Flood renovation companies, I think um, we've, we've been talking to several of those and we, we all just talked about Adler and Allen, there's, there's Belfour and Rainbow, there are others. The trouble is they, they tend to have a very short-sighted uh, goal uh, and, and view of, uh, of the industry and they keep saying, if I put your products onto the property and they don't flood, then I'm not going to have an industry to work to anymore. When you consider there's over three million houses at risk of flooding in this property, I don't think they're going to be going out of business anytime soon. So I think we need to try and help those people understand about prevention rather than, uh, than, than cure. I think there's a lot of manufacturers of various products in the marketplace and I think they actually are, as it says here, happy with the status quo. They're, they're churning out product, they're, they don't need to, sue, to do much different to actually earn a nice profitable living. So the manufacturers aren't incentivized, I don't think, to bring out a lot of new technology to address this. They're making a, a good run there. And the retailers, I actually don't think they know that they're actually suppliers into this industry. Um, you cannot go along to a DIY store and buy flood resilient technology in that store there. You're still going to go and buy your plasterboard, your gypsum uh, and other materials. There is not a stockist in the land that actually you can go and buy. So you can't even make this into a DIY product if you, if you had the, the wherewithal to try and, try and do that. So then the last part of that introduction was about getting better access to the measures. So my next question is, okay, what are the measures? You know, are they just standard building materials that we've got out there at the moment? Uh, I, I suspect not. Uh, but a lot of them is about, and this is an, uh, an issue we have in our industry when we talk about uh, resistant products, is you can have the best technology in the world. If it's badly installed, it suddenly becomes the worst technology in the world. And I think that applies inside the building as well. If you've got some good materials that do exhibit some uh, water resistant technology is great, but you've got to put them together properly. You've got to put them together with a lot more care and a lot more attention to detail. We were looking at a hotel in Cockermouth and we were considering using a, a, a board, which is a manganese oxide board, to, to, to do that. Uh, but then when you look at the construction of the building, which is still stud walls with uh, uh, cavity insulation to stop noise be between those, we thought, well, if we actually can't stop the water getting behind the manganese oxide board, all we've done is introduced a very expensive rip out the next time that building floods. So that attention to detail about installation quality and standards is, is really important. New buildings, uh, people talk about it being difficult, but I'll, I'll come on to another slide in a while to show you that it really isn't. But new, new, new buildings is actually not rocket science. In the famous words of uh, Eric Morecambe, all the component parts are there, all you have to do is put them together in the right order and put them together with, with care. And when, we, when it comes to cost, the study we did with uh, DEFRA and Backer Architects, it looked like about a 10 to 15% premium on putting together these measures on a new build house. So it really should not be beyond the wit of a, a builder, a property developer, to take those into consideration when they're building on a floodplain. In the report that Peter referred to at the beginning there, they talked about uh, building regs. Uh, I'm old and cynical. I actually think building regs are going to be five or ten years in the making. I think this particular government is, is against that type of uh, regulation in the industry. So I actually think it's down to us to actually create those standards as a de facto standard within our industry. And it's been proven before that we could do that. One of the things that we're doing in our company is we're doing a KTP with Oxford Brookes University to try and understand buildings. The insurers have got some really good risk maps and they know pretty much where all the risks are within this land. What we don't know is what effect the water has on that property when it stays around it for a, a long period of time. We know, we know bricks are porous. We know engineering bricks are less porous. What happens with the quality of the insulation within there? We come inside and we look at the different materials we've got inside of that. So the study that we want to look at is how those components work on their own and then from my telecoms days systems integrate those into a house so that we can then say right we've got this this risk this lo this location with this house it's built in this style now we know what the flood model is within that that house when it has a particular flood event against it that then becomes much more critical to the insurance industry that they've got they can actually understand what what it is they're insuring So what could our role be? And I think it's, uh, it's not about supplying goods. I think our role is, about, is predominantly about education. Um, 
Joey talked about the poor take-up rate of, uh, of grants in the marketplace, and we've seen that 20 to 30 percent is an average. And I think so. There's a lot of education we need to get out there into the marketplace. People, I perceive, when I go around and talk to them, they always think the property level protection is second rate. It should be the government actually doing something for them. They should be stopping that river overflowing, uh, and they should be taking measures themselves. They don't perceive that they should be spending their own money on doing it. And examples of that in some roles, uh, in some uh, projects we're doing with, with Essex Council is the grants are typically £5,000. And you talk to someone in a house that's worth three, four hundred thousand pounds and the bill comes to five thousand five hundred pounds. They're really reluctant to spend that five hundred pounds of their own money to protect their property. So I think there's a reluctance there, um, uh, an education we need to do with those homeowners to do that. I think we have to educate builders that actually this is it, it's easy to do. Building new houses in a flood zone is not rocket science. It's very, very easy to do and it shouldn't be difficult for them to do it. I find it remarkable that people still build houses in a floodplain and actually put a flood barrier on it rather than a flood door. I'm not convinced who their people that are that are buying these houses, but I'm certainly I wouldn't buy one that had a manual barrier that went onto, went onto the door. Again, we talked about the flood restoration companies. I think we need to sort of uh, get into those people's their mindset that we're actually, they're not losing their business. This is, they've, got a, they've got a very strong business case for many, many years, and I think most of us will be retired before they go out of business, uh, particularly if you look at some of the, the, you know, the measures that are going in and the scale. We're only looking at, with the government plans from EA, you're only talking about taking tens of thousands of houses out of the uh, flood risk at a, at per annum. You, know, you can do the maths. You know, we're looking at uh, you know, hundreds of years to solve the problem. Loss adjusters, I'm going to be careful what I say um, over here, Aviva. Um, but I think loss adjusters do need educating on what's practical. And I think, it, again, it's part of the education process that we're talking about here is that if you don't know what's out there, and this equally applies to homeowners, if you don't know what's out there, you don't know what you can do. And I think loss adjusters, to a degree, are in that same market. And I think part of the problem is that within our industry, we're all SMEs. We don't have massive marketing budgets. We can't go on on the television and national newspapers and promote the solutions that's out there. So somehow we've got to get into the insurers and the loss adjuster network and show them what to do. Rather than changing that brand new kitchen and, and <coughs> spending all your insurance money on there, actually understand what the problem is and maybe put some tanking around it to stop the water getting in in the first place. So same amount of money you're spending, but uh, as, as, as Chris just alluded to, understand what your issues is and, and spend it wisely. So you're not spending more, you're just spending it wisely. So you don't even get into that term of betterment. I talked about standards and, uh, and awareness and I think um, this work that we're trying to do with Oxford Brooks is, is a way to do that. Those of you that are in the building industry will know there's a, a scheme out there called Robust Detail, which is all about how you, you put uh, soundproofing into buildings. I think if we can come up with a very similar model for the industry uh, around flood data, then we can actually start to drive those standards ourselves. And then by the time the legislation is caught up, we will have some de facto standards that people will already be working to. I think we need innovation in this marketplace. And I think from a product point of view, I think there's, there's quite a bit of that. Uh, out in there, but I think we need to make sure that we're fitting the product to the flood type. One of the things that we do when we send our uh, surveyors out there is to question people, and we, we buy in the, the, the survey reports from Argyle, which amplifies this, but you've got to understand what, the wa what that flood type is. If you talk to the homeowner, it's just water. He doesn't know where it's come from, probably doesn't care, he just wants it kept out of his house. But how that water got there is a really important part of understanding that piece of data that, that Chris was alluding to. You know, flash floods have a very different impact on a building as opposed to a long duration surface water and groundwater problem. And I think we need to educate the customer again that, you know, that building that, that riverbank higher and wider and longer isn't going to stop the water coming up in his basement. So we need to need go back and educate them there. And of course, then the products become very, very different. If you've got a... Um, a property, an older property with a wooden floor in it, 
if you know what the uh, inundation rate is of the water into that basement space and you can calculate how quickly you can pump it out, that's a perfectly serviceable solution just by putting pumps into a basement to keep that water out. As long as it doesn't break into the house, you've solved the problem. So match the technology with, with the solution on there. From a new build point of view, I've said this several times today, it's not rocket science. You just got to know what you're doing and put it in there. I think from a resilient repair point of view, it's harder. But I think if we get in at the right stage with a loss adjuster, and, and particularly when you're talking about things like tanking, when you've already actually taken that house apart and destroyed it, then is, uh, actually is the most cost effective time to start putting those technologies back into that house. So it's understanding when those technologies are more, more viable. And personally, I think grants are, are one, of, one of the worst things that's happened to our industry. I think flood re is the second one that's, uh, that's really bad for our industry. Flood re takes away incentives for people to actually look after themselves and, and put their buildings back into property. And flood grants actually absolutely takes away that incentive for people to spend their own money. Because if they see there's a grant coming down the, down the road, they will not spend their money. And I think it's, it's destroying the PLP industry in this country. We end up with a feast and famine type operation. When there's grants available, we've got business and a load of other people come out of the woodwork and try and get into that. The grants disappear and our market disappears with it. So we've got to come up with some interesting ways to actually wean people off of grants. And one of the things we've been uh, toying with in our marketing plan is how do we turn flood protection into a home improvement? People spend billions and billions of pounds every year on home improvements. The first thing that people do when they move into a house, apparently, is change the front door. If we can get them to change that to a flood-proof front door when they move in, they've, they've spent their own money on it and they haven't had to look for handouts from the government and they're starting to take um, th th their own uh, welfare into, uh, into being. Products is interesting. Uh, aesthetics to people are, are really important when you come and talk to their houses. It is their pride and joy after all. And if I'm going to put one of my ugly barriers, the one we make is particularly ugly, we put a U-shaped frame around the door and it signals we flood. And people don't like that. The aesthetics of your houses are, are not good. But I don't know if you can see this, but this, this is a flood-proof door down the bottom here. I think that looks like a normal door. The only time you'll notice, and most flood doors are the same, they've all got four hinges on them rather than three. Uh, but the aesthetics of what we're trying to do here is actually quite, quite important to people. But I think what we've got to try and do, and I think this actually addresses our, our concern about making things insurable, one of the things the insurance industry doesn't like is manual intervention. So if someone has actually got to get up and put a product in place, then the insurance industry is sort of questioning, saying, well, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it properly? Are they actually at home or are they asleep in, in, in the middle of the night? So I think the industry needs to move towards more of these technologies. And I've, I've spelt them out in the ways that we describe them as normally closed, which is a door which you don't need to do any action to at all. Automatic, which is barriers that we've got a roller shutter barriers and things like that. But they need, to, although they're activated by water, they need power to drive them, which is OK as long as you can consider the facts that power may not be available. So make sure you've, you've provided for the technology. But more and more passive solutions, I think, are, are, are coming in there with, with you know, act water activated devices. And you've seen the one in Cockermouth, the vertical rising barrier there that, that, that rises under the influence of the water. And similar, similar products are becoming available mostly in the commercial world at the moment because of a cost issue. But I think as the technology improves and we can see those coming down in price, they will be more more acceptable into that uh, residential market and I think once these type of technologies come in which are also fairly invisible when they're installed we'll start to see a bigger take up on on that technology and we've already done some work we were funded by uh, by DEFRA God bless them uh, with a project uh, about two years ago now which we did with BRE uh, and backer architects and it really shows you how to put all those components together in the right order. I think one of the things we've been very bad at is actually promoting that that white paper exists uh, and maybe maybe Gavin I see you sitting at the back there you can take an action to actually start promoting and pushing this paper out to property developers and architectures, architects to actually show them what can be done and how easy it is to do it. 
And Backer, those of you that watch Grand Designs will have seen their famous floating house that, uh, that was on the river at, uh, at Marlow. It's basically Mulberry Harbour with a big lump of concrete in the middle of it. Uh, well, and, uh, and it rises, rises up out of the water. I, I know that they've now done a similar project in London, which is m more uh, addressed to um, affordable homes. So I think once you start to get it, I mean, the, the house in Marlow was four million pounds, so hardly affordable. But I think once you start getting that into the lower ranges, this concept of living with water that the Dutch have been doing for, for donkey's years can become quite practical in this, in this country, and we can learn a lot from that. And going back to resilient repair, it is a lot harder to do. The biggest problem you have when you're doing resilient repair is the wall floor foundation junction, uh, which is really hard to get to. Um, typically can't get to it outside because the pavement come right up to it. Uh, and hard to get to internally because of all the fixtures and fittings in there. So we've got to think about when we can do this resilient repair or if there's smaller, simpler technologies that we can actually evolve to, to address that. And that, that, to me, is the Achilles heel of all of this technology we're talking about. If we can't get to that joint, then, that, then the water is still going to come through your house, whatever we do, regardless of that. And we've got to come up, I think, going back to my education point, We've got to come up to people and actually let them understand that we are not making their houses flood, we're making the flood resilient, we're not keeping the water out. We're keeping the water out to the best of our abilities. People will still flood and if you oversell yourselves, we're going to cause a lot of problems for ourselves. We worked on this, I think those of you who know Jessica Lamond will probably see some of her, her words in this and it's about trying to position um, where we are with flood resilience, what people can do and what they can afford. There are things that are cheap to do and we've talked about a po cost positive one here. Actually as you get older I think having PowerPoints on the floor is really hard actually so having them around the dado rail I think is really good. But again you get resistance from people because it looks odd. You know typically your houses have got your PowerPoints down on the skirting board, sticking them up around that dado level is odd but it's a good resilient measure. Some of the cost neutral ones on here, uh, as I said, putting the plasterboard on horizontally, putting your doors on rising butt hinges so you can take them off and take them upstairs, um, and just putting waterproof uh, plinths on your kitchen. A lot of the flooding in houses is very, very low level. You know, it's one or two inches. So if you've just got technology at that bottom level, whether it's the skirting boards or the plinths of your, of your kitchens, it's very easy to adapt. And for small uplifts, you can put more resilient technologies in there, as, uh, as it says on the wall there with pumps and lime plaster, uh, non-roof turn valves. If you know you're going to flood to a great extent, I mean, one of the, one of the things to remember is that 80% of flooding in this country is less than a foot. So most of the time, we should be able to keep it out. It's those extreme events that we need to, to think about, these more cost-benefit ratio uh, solutions in there. So, you know, do we put in manganese oxide boards? Do we put in floodproof furniture and kitchens and that like? And innovation doesn't have to look ugly. I think this is uh, a kitchen that we, uh, we work with the guys from, it's an import from Germany. Um, you would probably refer to it as a plastic kitchen. But one of the things that we've worked with them on, rather than going for the whole uh, shebang, is actually just supply the carcass. Carcass is typically made out of chipboard and that's the bit that falls apart and people want to change the front doors and the, and the counters anyway over time. So just make sure your, your carcasses and your infrastructure in your properties are, are resilient and you can achieve a lot of benefits. We're quite impressed with nanotechnology. As you can see there, that breeze block, which is one of the most porous building materials around, can be made flood resilient by putting this technology around it. You're still limited when you're doing uh, resilient repairs to what you can see. Uh, and obviously you've still got leakage passed through it, but if we can start to introduce some of this technology, maybe at the manufacturing stage, then we can introduce uh, some better, uh, better ways of resilient repair. But even though we've got great technology there, we've still got to make sure we install it properly. If you install my, my, my carcasses on my kitchen cabinet there, but you actually haven't stopped the water getting behind it, then you've actually defeated all of your, your objectives and you've wasted a lot of money. My last slide is, uh, is one of our burning ambitions, um, as, as Joe referred to, this great innovation park around here. 
and we actually have our our test centre is on this business park here. We've got a big test tank over the back there, uh, which we now do flood uh, flood product testing on. But if you look around every single building on here, not one of them is flood resilient. And these are the houses of the future. And that's a bit scary. So what we want to do is we want to build a house here that we can actually showcase and show people that it works. I think what BRE are doing with the Victorian Terrace is, is a good starting point. But this technology, if we can get uh, some funding for it, as you can see, we're going to put a fish tank around the outside of it and we're going to show you that we can keep the water out. And then we're going to put the water inside it and show you that it's flood resilient. Um, and I think this is the way that we can start to address some of those parts in the action plan that Peter alluded to at the beginning on there. Make things certifiable, get standards around them, make sure they're insurable, and then we can get people to actually start looking after themselves. If you liked that presentation, my name's John Alexander. If you didn't, my name's Gavin George. <laughs> Thank you.